Okay, so talking today about other aspects of development, moral reasoning, discipline, and gender. Okay, so I want you to pause this and read this excerpt. Um, this is a hypothetical situation, and I want you not only to read it, but then answer the question at the bottom, should the husband have done that? And when you have your response, move on to the next slide. Okay, so moral reasoning. We have a theory advanced by a man named Lawrence Kohlberg. And Lawrence Kohlberg, in trying to understand how children develop this sense of morals, um, this ethical sense of what is right and wrong, he would present children and adults with those stories similar to the one that you just read about Heinz. And then he would ask them, should the husband have done that? And based on their responses, then he came up with these different levels um, of reasoning. So first we have the pre-conventional level where decisions are made based on punishment or relativism. So the decisions are made then based on will you get in trouble? for um, stealing the drug or you know that everything is relative every single person has some kind of right um, to make the decision that they do based on their own personal relativism the second level is the conventional level and in the conventional level we look at the motives behind what a person did so we're looking to see did this person have good motives such as he was a good man for wanting to save her we're also looking at um, actions that will help to maintain the social order, so society maintaining actions. Um, so a response that falls under society maintaining may say, well, he had good motives, but I can't condone theft because theft does not help to maintain the social order within society. Finally, there is the um, post-conventional level and Kohlberg believed that many people will never actually make it to this particular level of moral reasoning and if you um, make it to this level of moral reasoning you reason using social contract um, or universal ethical principles so with the social contract idea um, a response might say well life is more important than property and so yes he should have done that because his wife's life should trump everything um, and then finally the universal ethical principles um, this standing states that if all parties were to take the perspective of others we would be able to reach some kind of a just solution so how then do we work with children to develop this sense of moral reasoning how do we get them to want to be good so there are a couple of different discipline techniques that you um, may have experienced or that you might use with children the first is a discipline technique called power assertion where the parent or caregiver uses punishment and authority to correct misbehavior so instead of giving the child a reason why a particular behavior is expected you might say do it or else do it because I said so with induction, the parent appeals to the child's own resources, abilities, sense of responsibility, or feelings for others in correcting misbehavior. So with induction then, you're basically trying to get the child to understand how her behavior impacts someone else okay so how her behavior affects another person you're trying to teach the child perspective taking skills so let's say that you have you know a little girl who just hit her brother and you say okay so when you hit your brother it hurts him or you could ask the child some kinds of leading questions how do you think it makes your brother feel when you hurt him how do you feel when someone hits you um, and that way you can kind of get the child to start to understand that her actions actually impact and affect other people. So induction then, out of these two techniques of induction and power assertion, induction is a much more effective way to 
teach children this sense of morality and getting children to be good because power assertion doesn't really tell the child anything right it only tells the child what not to do but it doesn't give the child a compelling reason to actually follow um, that particular course of action Okay, so let's talk about self-control, um, particularly self-regulation. So self-regulation, this ability to suppress an initial wish to do something in favor of doing something else that's not as much fun. So you guys probably do this all the time. So even as you're sitting here listening to this video, you are probably thinking that there are 10,000 other things that would be more fun at this point in your life. However, you are able to suppress that urge, that wish to do something else, something that's more fun. Maybe you want to go shopping. Maybe you want to go hang out outside. You want to go talk to your friends. You want to do some... Um, you know, checking Facebook, something like that, you're able to suppress that initial wish to do something else that's not as much fun. And the thing that is not as much fun is listening to this lecture. So with self-regulation then, I want you to make sure that um, you watch the video of the Walter Mitchell marshmallow task because this is a really great video that shows um, the effects of self-regulation and follow up with these children who participated in the original marshmallow task study um, found that children who were able to inhibit that impulse early um, in life. They were able to delay that gratification now for a larger reward later. Um, this relates to their ability to control negative emotions, to pay attention, to do well in school from kindergarten to college. So kids who were able to inhibit that impulse early in life, this is a skill set that follows them throughout their lives and relates to a number of very positive outcomes. Okay, so let's talk about gender. So how do children begin to understand that they are male or female? So first we have this concept of gender identity, a fundamental sense of being male or female, um, independent of whether or not the person conforms to the social and cultural rules for gender. Gender typing then is the process by which children learn the abilities, interests, personality traits, and behaviors that are associated with being masculine or feminine. Okay, so identity then is this fundamental sense of being male or female. Gender typing is when the child learns the kinds of um, abilities and interests that are appropriate for a male or a female in that given society. Influences on gender development. So how do children come to learn um, the interests and abilities that are appropriate for men and women. So there are um, some biological factors that might come into play here. So biological researchers believe that um, preference for play and toys, so this preference that, you know, girls play with dolls and boys play with trucks, um, might have some kind of basis in prenatal hormones, gene, or brain organization. People who uh, attack this problem from a cognitive perspective suggest that toy preferences are based on gender schemas. So these are mental networks of knowledge, belief, metaphors, and expectations about what it means to be male or female, okay? So they believe that these children have picked up from others around them, um, these complex set of beliefs about what boys do and what girls do. Learning factors or a behavioral approach here says that um, children learn the kinds of interests or abilities that are appropriate for boys and girls because they are reinforced or rewarded by parents, teachers, and peers when they engage in um, play that matches the gender role stereotypes or the gender expectations. So if we have a little girl who's playing with dolls, we might say, oh, isn't that so wonderful? You know, she's playing with a doll. But if we have a little boy who's playing with dolls, we might say, oh, you shouldn't be playing with dolls. Come over here. Why don't you play with these cars instead? So that's an example of um, reinforcement from others for engaging in so-called appropriate play.